All right, here we go. Today we have a legend in the building, five-time NBA champion, the greatest rebounder of all time, Dennis Rodman. Welcome to Vlad TV. What's up, man? What's up, people around the world? What's up? Yeah. Man, long time fan. Thank you so much for coming in today. Oh, good. Well, this is your first time here, so I want to start in the very beginning. So you're born in uh, Trenton, New Jersey. Wow. Really? You're gonna really? You want to start that early? <laughs> we want to start that early. Uh, no, no, yeah, Trenton. That's cool. Yeah, man. I was born in Trenton. Okay. And uh, your dad was actually in the Air Force, and later on, he was in the Vietnam War. Right. Well, I, but, I, can't, I can't tell you too much about that. <laughs> so, right. you know, I, cool. He ended up leaving when you were three years old. What? Well, I didn't, didn't even know him. So it was all good, you know, back and forth, back and forth. So but in that, I didn't, there was no main figure in the house. So I didn't know who he was. Well, when I looked it up, I, I found different numbers in terms of how many kids he had. I heard 26. I heard as much as 47. Do you know how many kids he had? <laughs> All I knew was I was the first one, <laughs> so you know. Oh, oh, you were his oldest. I, 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 I was the first one, so basically, and that I don't know what he did. Uh, I, I heard some stories, but I read a book that he wrote uh, about me, and uh, he had sixteen wives. So sixteen six, wives. Sixteen wives. It was like with twenty nine kids, or da 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 da. You know, I'm like I don't know, man. I, I wasn't trying to do no research or background on him, but um, that's all I heard about him. Sixteen wives, twenty nine kids. That's what I heard. Okay, and you grew up with two sisters. Yep. Did you ever meet any of your half brothers or half sisters later on in life? I met a couple, you know, because you know what they wanted. You know, <laughs> they wanted money. You know, they got these women coming in asking me, uh, "Do you know that this is your brother?" I said, "What do you mean?" I said, "This is your brother from your dad." I said. I just say, what dad? I said, That's okay, great. I said, I agree. You know, his name is Rodman. I'm like. Great. Okay. What? You know, but you know, they got their hands out. You know, because I'm the famous one of the whole family. You know, you know, so it's like they expect me to just throw money out there. Yeah, that's how it goes sometimes, unfortunately. Oh, Everyone good. wants something out of you. I know, right? <laughs> yep. I mean, I know your sisters became, you know, star athletes. Did any of your other half siblings do anything like sports wise or no? I guess I, I, I seen two. That was it. I saw one that was like six foot nine. And okay. He, he, he brought like a birth certificate and all this stuff, pictures of him. And I guess um, this, <laughs> this woman that was overweight, I was like, my dad did that. That's kind of fucking right. <laughs> I was like, shit. <laughs> and I was like, and this kid was like light skinned, but he looked almost just like me. And I'm like, oh, wow, you actually do look like me. And uh, he said, yeah, I'm your head brother. I'm like, I got that great, cool. So he wanted me to put him through college and shit. And I'm like, oh, man. That's the reason why you can't chase me down. That's the only reason why. <laughs> you yeah. didn't come and get to know me or meet me? What the, what's up? I mean, your two sisters, you know, did you guys maintain a close relationship throughout your life? Not really. I mean, you know, it's just, it's one of those families when you live in a project and uh, we get more emotion. Living in a project and you just... You just you have no direction, right? You have nowhere to um, just be you. It's just more like what you see in your surroundings, what you can be into, and stuff like that. You know, stealing, killing, robbing, doing all those things like that, going to jail, prison, stuff like that. That's what your option was back then. So, me and my sisters, they they did very well in college. Yep, they did very well right. in college. I was like more like a like the uh, the donkey. You know, doing nothing, going there, doing the same thing I just said, stealing, robbing. I wasn't killing nobody, or, you know, stabbing people. I wasn't doing that, but I was just doing all the other simple stuff. They what they call it in the project, simple. Stealing and robbing, that's simple. But uh, um, so, yeah, that's that's what I was doing. It they was, they was uh, have their careers going on right there. And my sister played overseas, stuff like that. So. Well, I remember you mentioned in uh, some of your interviews, and I believe your book as well, that growing up in an all-female household, your sisters would they kind of dress you up like a girl when you were young? Oh man, that's kind of, that was so, that was so gay. <laughs> so, I, had to, I, I, I thought every time I see them, I said, "Oh Lord," and, and it, it brings me back. I was like, "Oh wow," because it seems like there was no male figure. I, was, I said earlier, there's no male figure, so they just dressed me as a girl and stuff like that. So I really didn't fall into that mode. You know, because I could have went in that, you know, 
and the direction, you know. But uh, for some of the reason I, di I didn't do that, I guess uh, I guess something changed in me when I started playing basketball. Yeah. Well, I mean, playing basketball originally when you were a freshman, you were short. You were like five six. Well, five six, five seven. Yep. Yeah. And, and when did the growth spurt actually start? Was it like after high school? No, it was like when I was twenty years old. That's crazy. Like, I, I mean, literally jumped up like quick, man. You know, stuff like that. You know, every time you put on a pair of pants, they come onto your knees almost. And so you put on a pair of shoes, you got to cut the back off to make it like a, you know, like, you know, Dave and Busters or some stuff like that. So it's like, but it's like, you know, you, you couldn't, back to like I said, we, can't afford, we couldn't afford anything like that. So so I had to go get a job and da 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 da. But uh, yeah, that growth spurt was like quick. Yeah, I mean, that's insane. I mean, usually growth spurts happen like sometime during yes. high school, 15, right. 16, 17. But to have a growth spurt from at 20 to go from 5'11 to six foot seven is right. just like, it's extraordinary. Yeah, that's like, you know, that's rare though. But, uh, you know, like I said, thank God it happened. That's all I can say, thank God it happened. Right. And because at one point, like before the growth spurt, or maybe around during the growth spurt, you were like somewhat homeless, like oh, yeah, so I was forth. homeless like two or three years. Yeah, that's crazy. And stuff like that, you know. Like I said, it's a trip story, man. It's like, like, wow. It's like, hey, it's amazing that that happened to me. And um, wow, here I am today doing stuff like this. So, an assistant coach at Southeastern Oklahoma State University. That's what. That's the person that really noticed you, and had you go play over there. And that's when things started to really take off, basketball wise, for you. Yeah, it did. But it was more like you know when you go to. Um, from the projects, carrying a garbage bag, I suck it emotion. Yeah. Okay. It's all so, good. It's all good. It's all good. But yeah. I, like, yeah, I just, yeah, man. It was, uh, I think that was like one of those um, breakthrough moments you have in your life, right? And uh, that's what happened. These two guys came and knocked on the door, knocked on the door, and like, um, and they asked him, hey, is Dennis Robin here? I said, no, he's not here. I'm standing right there, right? <laughs> they said, I said, I said, I said, and I actually shut the door, but they knocked, they knocked again. I said, yeah, that's who I am. And stuff like that. I thought I was going to prison. <laughs> you got two white guys in suits and shit. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> it's okay. What I do now? You know, so, uh, but uh, there's, there's two coaches from Southeast Oklahoma and they came in wanted me to go um, try out for the team. Well, and then things just took off. You became an MVP over there. You set a bunch of records over there, which ultimately led you to the 86 NBA draft. I mean, were you thinking, like, at what point in your life, like, how old were you when you were like, okay, I'm actually going to play in the NBA? Because in high school, that wasn't even a consideration. Uh, I think I was, I was my last year in college. You know, I sat on the farm, you know, working my ass off in the fields and stuff like that with the family and all that stuff like that. And when the family's in, in the house watching uh, the draft and I'm over there playing with the little white kid you know, that, that I live with and we out there playing basketball and stuff like that. They said, oh, Dennis, you just got called up by the Detroit Pistons. Like, really? I said, God, dude. I, I said, I did? I was shocked. I'm like, okay, I did? And the kid, you know, we, we run into towards the house. I didn't know that the glass door was closed. I just went straight into the fucking thing. <laughs> oh, like I'm, they looking at me like, are you dead? <laughs> I like boom, like oh hell. And then it's like, okay, great. Then I was so happy, man. The next thing you know, it was, and I guess that history started to be made. Right, you got picked uh, third in the second round, twenty seventh overall. Right. And like, how big was that initial contract that first year? Oh man! <laughs> wow, let's see. <laughs> <It's just laughs> we come compare today. Oh my god! I, I be working in K marks. <laughs> That's how big that contract was. It was like more like seventy five, eighty grand at the most. Oh wow! So you got like almost like a like a working man's job playing well, for the I NBA. Worked, I worked out there in the NBA for two years. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was making like that's the kind of money I was making compared to making fifty million a day, eighty thousand then. Like, like, hey, what the hell? 
Okay. So you join in 86, and then by 87, the Pistons made it to the playoffs. Did you feel like by that time that you were like, okay, I'm really getting to my swing, and I'm really like becoming a force in the NBA? Oh, no. I was still green, man. I was still green. I was just sitting, uh, following people's levels, man, and, and trying to figure out what is my position in this game. Stuff like that. I'm using scoring in college, rebounding, da 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 da. And then, you know, Isaiah pretty much like my mentor, pretty much. And Chuck Day is like my, like my father. And I love him. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was just, I was just playing the game just because I love playing the game. I didn't know, I didn't know the fundamentals of the game. I just knew how to work to be in the game. And so I, I love working hard. And uh, I think that's the reason why people enjoy me in Detroit because I work so much hard. I, you know, when I, I got paid, what, a thousand bucks a game, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like 82 games. <laughs> really. Well, I remember after playing uh, the Celtics uh, that year, you made a comment. You said, uh, Larry Bird is overrated in a lot of areas. Why does he get so much publicity? Because he's white. You never hear about a black player being the greatest. When you look back on that, do you still agree? Do you think that Larry Bird was overrated, or do you think you were just mad at the time? No, I told you. I just, I just said. I said I was green. I, I was just saying anything, man. Just because you know what, I was frustrated because guess what? I got my ass whooped by this kid. You know, so that's, that's why I probably said something like that. Not because I was angry or hatred or something like that. No, it just came out like that, and uh, because uh, I really wasn't paying attention to the whole league. I was just paying attention to my team. And stuff like that, and uh, I was just wondering why this guy's so so good or whatever you call it. I'm like, great. And so I think I would have said the same thing about uh, if he was black. I think I would say the same thing. I see, you know, I would have said something in, in a different direction. But so happy he had to be, you know, Larry Bird, and uh, I apologize that many many times over. But uh, that's history. Yeah, but, um, yeah, but uh, hey, you know. Gotta move on. I remember I had Gilbert Arenas on my show recently, and, and he raised a lot of eyebrows because he said one on one from the three point line, Larry Bird could beat LeBron James. One on one on that type of game. He was built more of a one. Larry Bird would probably beat LeBron one on one. Really? Larry Bird would beat LeBron one -on -one. James one on one. Ooh. Because one on one, one on one, it takes away from everything LeBron has, right? Mm. His physical strength, his speed, right? Um, and you know, all that power he has going well in one on one, you're talking about one, two dribbles. That's not his corners, yeah, that's not his like game. That, yeah. That's Larry's, that's Larry's whole game. Would you agree or disagree? So I leave. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> it, it, uh, okay, I'll, I'll put it this way. If Larry Bird playing this era, I think he'd be in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just letting you know, man. Really? You know, I, like I said, I'm just saying he'd be somewhere over there. Because, you know, I think his game was fit for Boston at that time in the 80s and stuff like that. You know, but uh, so uh, today's world, oh, hell no. There's, there's no way. I'm not this, this, uh, Play, uh, downplaying him because he's a great player at that time, just like I was. And, uh, but I'm saying, no, there's no way. No way. I think, I think the kid from, uh, Denver is way better than him. Jokic. Oh my God. He's slow as hell. You know, it's okay. So, but that guy got a game. You know what I'm saying? I think he's better than Larry Bird. I mean, in this, in this day and age, yeah. But I'm yeah, saying, I can see the argument for that. Absolutely. No, I'm saying he can shoot that three like, oh my God. So, wow. Compare him to, to Larry Bird. I think people pick him. Fair enough. All right, so next year, you guys made it to the NBA Finals. How did you feel to finally make it to the Finals? It was good. It was, it was one of those things that we could have won three in a row. My life would have changed then, but it didn't. But we came maybe 30 seconds from not being a champion. Not being yeah. a champion, so uh, I just think that it wasn't our time. I think we were just building up to that, up to that statue, to be in a position and stuff like that. And once we got the taste of it, we wanted more. We wanted more. And the next year, we all came back in the summertime, start working, 
to start working. And uh, we, we became uh, the bad boys. Well, right, because that next year in 89, you became the Defensive Player of the Year, <laughs> and you guys played the Lakers again in the NBA Finals, and you swept them, 4-0. Yeah, we swept them. We swept them that time. You know, I think that's when I had the back spasms and stuff like that. I really didn't play um, a lot of minutes because I had that back spasm because my ex-wife was trying to take me to court and take my daughter. I think I was thinking about that too much and stuff like that. So, um, But uh, the team came together, man. Everybody rallied. and. We, hey man, we was on a roll. Right. And then at that point, you're off to the races. Oh, well, yeah. Because that next year, you won your second Defensive Player of the Year award. You made it to the playoffs. You guys beat the Bulls again. And then in the finals, you guys beat the Trail Blazers. And then now you have two rings. Right. I was here. How did it feel to, to, to win two in a row like that? Oh, man. It's just like anything. Shit. <laughs> How you get married and get divorced twice? It sucks, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, off the page. Oh, uh, no, no, but no, Portland, I was hurt then. I was hurt then mm. too. Uh, I think I had like a calf injury or something like that, but I, I, I still played in the game. But uh, it, felt, it felt really good. Even when in Portland, we went in Portland, and it's just like, you know, like the Denver Nuggets being heat. I, lo- I love being on the road, especially winning. I love being on the roof, uh, playing basketball and winning and stuff like that. That show you had persevering, you got strength, you got uh, understanding, and you got uh, some 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 power in your body and your life to play this game. No matter where you at in the world, and you still win, right? You still win. Well, that next year you guys made it to the playoffs, uh, <laughs> but then the Chicago Bulls end up stopping you, and and in that game, that's when you gave Pippen the six stitches. Yeah. And you guys eventually worked that out. But in that game, do you feel like you were wrong in that regard? Or do you think, listen, we're playing hard, shit happens? No, that was a bad, bad move. Uh, I think that was just more frustrating than anything. I think uh, I wasn't trying to put him out the game. I, I think, you know, <laughs> it was more like this. I just, uh, I can't use the image of the bad boys that made me do that. I can't use that. You know, it, was just, it was just a moment, a moment right there, stuff like that. And I think that they knew that they had us. They knew, and I thought the fact that I said, wow, man, if we go out and go out with a bang and stuff like that. And uh, uh, once I thought, once we went to the locker room, I said, hey, they, just like us, playing Boston, they're trying to reach like us, and so I was doing like we doing, and now they're doing it. You know, so they, they, they I said, wow, once Michael got Scotty Pippen, it was a wrap. Okay. So that next year, Chuck Daly ended up leaving, and you guys were super close, mm-hmm. super close. And I feel like was that around the time some of the problems started? Because that's when you skip preseason camp, you got fined like sixty eight thousand dollars. <laughs> that's when I started making money. Mm. And that's okay. That, but when when Chuck Daly left, man, that that was a oh boy, I, I couldn't take that one. That was just hard. But uh, yeah, I stayed in my house too for like four months straight. I didn't even leave. I stayed there four months. I had friends come over, bring me food, groceries, and stuff like that. I didn't even leave, man. I, I was just so pissed, man. I was like, wow. I thought this game was an loyalty. See, not, my mind started to think like that. I think the game was loyalty. I was like, what the hell? Do people screw people over like this all the time in this in this sport? I'm like, I didn't know anything about the business. I wasn't thinking about the business. I was thinking about going down playing and winning. And that was my whole process. But I didn't know anything about that. And then I'm like, okay, great. They let him go for what? So I like, I just got really down for a minute. Right. Wasn't that same year that you got married, then got divorced 82 days later? I mean, that's one of, I'm sorry. We're going to call you a day, man. <laughs> I was going to call you that F word. <laughs> uh, no, it's like, man, that's when I got divorced, married, all this stuff like that. Everything just started crumbling from that point on. I don't want to go in all that stuff like that because it all happened in once. Yeah. And stuff like that. So, you know, that, that I was dealing with a lot of those uh, uh, areas that uh, a lot of people don't want to deal with. And uh, I just, I think I was just too young in the mind at the age of 26, I mean, 27, 28, you know, mm-hmm. but I'd never been through that experience before. You know, alone just being in the NBA, I never been in like a marriage and having a baby and, 
Well, stuff like that. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I wasn't equipped for that. Well, right, because that next year, that's when the incident happened that they found you asleep in the car with a shotgun. Oh, well, we gonna do this stuff again. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's, that's okay. If you, if you don't want to talk about it, I'll, I'll respect your privacy. I, I know you spoke about it. Everyone knows that. You know, I, I fell asleep yeah. in the car and had a gun to my uh, my mouth, and uh, I fell asleep to Pro Jam. Yeah, yeah. Pro Jam and stuff like that. that. I think that actually saved me. Yeah, I fell asleep like that, and I think the whole city of Detroit was around my car, you know, stuff like that. And they want to put me in a mental hospital. I said, I'm not mentally dumb. I think a lot of people knew what I was going through. Yeah, you're going through heartache, man. We've all gone through. We've all just thought the world was crumbling when the woman in your life just, you know, because didn't you think that she was cheating with someone on the Pistons? <laughs> Do you want me to ask all this stuff, man? You want, to, you want the world to know all about this stuff? All good. Like, you know, I'm, like, I'm not trying to put no, uh, like anyone um, in, in, on a blast mode. I'm not going to try to do that. I'm just saying, well, she was doing that. But guess what? We moved past it and stuff like that. We talk, we we broke bread and stuff like that. I said, hey, I can't do anything about that. You know, guess what? But I, I had to go play a game that night. We won and stuff like that. So anyway, so I think that uh, I think Chuck Daddy felt so bad for me. And he actually, they actually cut him from the team. Huh. That's because of that. Well, I remember you, I saw a video, I think it was with Vice, where you talked about that you broke your penis three times in three different incidents. Right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think that's something kind of legendary about me going, you know, like like in Houston. Matter of fact, I did it here in Houston. Yeah. At the W Hotel. You know, it's like <laughs> Oh man, those are good old days, huh? <laughs> Those are the good old days, you know. Like God, Lord, you know when you when you when you <laughs> when you when you miss, it's kind of wow. Next thing you know, next thing you know, you go that you know going to a blood bank. What? You know. <laughs> Oh no! I mean, I've, oh, I've heard like, stories. Uh, it's like, hey, <laughs> see, yeah. and the girl's like fucking crying, and she's like, "Oh my god, are you dying?" I'm like, "I am." <laughs> so, 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 uh, for some other reason, the next day we went to the, the Houston uh, practice facility downtown, but everyone knew. I like, oh no! And I said, then next, and the, the doctor said, "Okay, great, Dennis." You know. I, I know what that is. I know what that is. So um, I know what it is too. He said, "You have a contused penis. Contused. Contused." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know, man. I know what it is. But he said, "Just give me the lamest term. Oh, your dick is broke." So uh, okay, great, thanks. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, that night I played a game. You broke it. Wait, 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 wait. You played a game with a broken penis. Yeah. Wow. Okay, I'm, I'm saluting you right now. No, no seriously, that's the way guys people. Are. Yeah, I did that night. Okay, because because I remember I was talking. Um, I remember I did an interview with some girl who did porn, and she said that like some dude on set broke a penis, broke his penis trying to do something extra. Right. And I guess that was her boyfriend. And I guess they had to stitch it up. So then when he would get hard, it would like tear the stitches later on. And he just it just sounds like a nightmare overall. I mean, is a broken penis the worst thing you went through or? Oh, what? I tell that story all the time, man. Everyone knows my life, man. Everyone in the world knows my damn life because I, I I put my life on the line every time I do interviews. And that way, so I have no, have no excuses why my life is not going well. So I, I destroy myself as, so, uh, before anyone else does. But uh, no, I never had no stitches like that, man. It just swells huh, up. Like, okay. it's, it's, it just swells up. I mean, oh. it's, it's, like, it's like, wow. And then... <laughs> It just it just swells up, man. It swells, uh, swells okay. up. It's like, it, it's like you you really can't have sex. You really can't, you know. So that's that's the way it is. It just swells up like something like that, and it's it's typical. I mean, you would think after the first time you broke your penis, you would take extra precautions not to break your penis again. But you you did a three peat essentially <laughs> with yeah. your penis. Yeah, man. You know, 
It's one of those days when you get active of love, brother, yes, sir. When you get active of love, and the next thing you know, you want to do some really cool stuff, you know. And, hey, when you miss, you miss. <laughs> <laughs> when you miss, you miss, okay? <laughs> so, but anyway, I, the girl freaked out again. They all freaked out. They said, oh, my God, what am I? Like, mm. they just freaking out because, you know, everything comes out. It's all blood, you know. It's it's <laughs> you want to talk about this, right? <laughs> so it's all blood. It's everything coming like, blood. Okay, so so that year you had three years left on your contract, but you actually demanded a trade. You had like twelve million dollars left, but you traded to the San Antonio Spurs. Well, was there a reason why you decided to leave that year? I just I, I wanted to get the hell out of there because everybody was gone. Everybody was getting traded, and this, and I just got fed up. I said, I'm done, man. I'm done. I am done with this man, stuff like that. But the good thing came out of that. I still let the league rebound. Mm. That's a crazy thing about it. <laughs> After all those problems, I still let the league and rebound. I mean, averaging, I don't know, 17, 18 rebounds a game. With all the distraction I had going on, I'm like, oh, man. I said, but that kept me going mentally-wise because I, I love working hard. I said it in an interview. I love working hard and stuff like that. And that just kept me motivated to just keep going. And then once they traded me to San Antonio Spurs, I'm like, wow. Okay, great. Cool. East Coast. I mean, West Coast. Mm -hmm. All right. So when you got to the Spurs, that's when I feel like the de the real Dennis Rodman came out. That's when oh, yeah. you dyed your hair blonde, had the mohawk. And it's like, all right, I'm not, I'm not going to play this the standard role. I'm going to be myself. How good did it feel to finally just open up and be yourself at that point? Sean so Detroit made me a man, dude. Isaiah, you know, Joe D. Morris, you know, Chuck Daly, they made me a man, dude. I said, oh, shit, I can't play this anymore. I can't follow people like this anymore. I got to go out there and try to you know, make make something for myself and just try to, you know, be, you know try to blend in. And uh, I st started being a follower all the time. And, yeah, man, when I went there, man, it was life just... For some early reason, it changed. I didn't want it to be like that, but it, it just changed quick. I went, oh, great. So I think when it actually really changed, I said, oh, I'm bored. So I, this girl, uh, Kim Hunt, you know, they own Hunt ketchup stuff like that. I was dating her, and we went to a mall in San Antonio. And uh, I was just walking through the mall, and this this tall, six-foot gay uh a Hispanic guy came over with this long, thick black hair with a silver streak coming down and stuff like that. I'm like, I just looked at him like, wow, look at that. You know, <laughs> so it's, he came up to me and said, hey, Dennis, you know, I didn't change your hair color. I said, you do? I wasn't even thinking about that. I said, so, uh, great. So I went up there into his, his shop and uh, I actually fell asleep for two hours. And once I woke up, I, he said, oh, we finished. I said, all right, great. I looked, I said, oh, hell. I said, oh, you did this? It was you know, like blonde mohawk. I like, you did that? I'm like, all right, great. We went to the movies after that. And uh, went to movies like that. And then we went to go see this movie called Demolition Man. Yeah, with I, I know Wesley anything. Snipes. I'm like, <laughs> didn't expect, I even see the previous or anything. Then once I got in, I said, oh, nope. And she looked at me and said, this is not right. This is not deja vu, is it? I went, really? So, and that the next day, we had the appreciation day for the team. And they introduced me to it. And I said that whole thing, you can love me or hate me. I'm going to come here. I'm going to do one thing. That's, and pretty much my life from that point on changed. Well, I mean, that team was built around David Robinson, and it seemed like the two of you didn't really get along. Is that a, a fair assessment? Well, I just say, you know, we didn't see eye to eye. But mm. it, it wasn't the fact that we love playing with each other. We love playing with each other. It's just an off the court that we couldn't adjust to. Okay. Was that around the time that you and Madonna had your thing? 
Okay, we're going to ask that question too. <laughs> you go ask that. Well, well, okay, well, knows, well, let me ask, knows, let me, let me ask this question. We have, everyone knows our native Madonna. If we went out for a minute and stuff like this, so it was all good. Yeah, that's, that's around that time. Yeah. Okay, well, let me ask you a question. Because I remember, I think it was, it was on some uh, talk show where you said when Madonna called you in the room, was the first time, because you said, I'm not the only one, was the first Madonna experience, was it a threesome? <laughs> Boy, you know, <laughs> people gonna love this interview, huh? <laughs> people yeah. love this damn interview. No, I mean, it's, it's just one. Like we, we had a, a mutual agreement what the top situation was, stuff like that. I respect Madonna, man. You know, she, she's a, like, a play this. She's probably the only woman has created all these young girls today to the way they are today. I give her that. I give her that because she's the one who was out there crazy doing all this stuff and all this stuff. And, and these young girls are pretty much emulating her right now. And uh, even though she's older, but she, they should be patting her ass on the back because she gave her, they gave, she gave these young kids today a platform. But as far as me and her you know, doing that thing, I said, no, nah, I never wanted to have sex with her in the beginning. No, that's true. I didn't want, but she knows the story. I know the story. So. Right. Well, I guess on the Breakfast Club, you said that she offered you twenty million dollars to have a baby with her, which I guess she denied later on. Are you still sticking by that story? Why not? Why not? <laughs> why not? I mean, why not? Because I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna to throw her on the bus or me on the bus. It's more like it's more like a, a mutual agreement and a contract and stuff like that. So, you know, it didn't happen. So I can I say, hey, I lost, but I didn't. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So the next year, um, well, well, you, you, go year you go to year to year. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, you know, oh, the main stuff in every year. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're a legendary guy, man. What, what do you, you know what I mean? So go ahead. Okay. Well, th that next year you had some injuries. Um, you know, even though, even though the Spurs won 62 games, but things kind of fell apart in the playoffs. And after that, that's when you decided to go to the Chicago Bulls. Oh, I didn't decide to do shit. Uh, shit, they just traded me. I said, I agree. I was like, yep, thank God. But, you know, that was like more like they traded Dennis Rodman to Chicago. And I was like on, literally on the top of my game, literally on top of my game. I was in the best shape of my, of my whole life. And uh, I, I worked out twice a day. I... I wasn't really partying that much that back then. And uh, I was really focused on like just winning, winning another championship. And uh, when they said, San Antonio traded for Dennis Robinson, uh, San Antonio traded Dennis Robinson to the San, uh, Chicago Bulls for Will Purdue. People looked at it and said, what? Will <laughs> Purdue? <laughs> it's like, wow. That's how much San Antonio hate my guts. <laughs> Damn. I'm like, I'm like, Will Purdue? And I'm like, oh man, this ain't funny. But it's like, I mean, people in Chicago was laughing. Say, we got rid, we got rid of something like a giraffe, and we got a a lion. Mm -hmm. We got a lion coming in here, man. You better to attack. Yes, sir. Well, the reason I said you decided was because from what I read, um, Phil Jackson actually met with you before the trade and said, listen, you know, do you want to play? And you said, well, honestly, I don't give a damn. That's and true. his response was, well, Scotty Pippen still feels a certain type of way over those six stitches. So, you know, they wanted you to apologize to him. Is that, is that a fair recap? Oh, that's true. Everyone knows that story. That's true. We yeah. said, we said, uh, Jimmy Cross's house, me, Michael and Scotty and Phil Jackson, we said his house. And I was outside with Phil talking to him. He said, oh, Dennis, can you go in there? I'm like, all right. Well, I said, I, I do it. And I went and I said, man, there's it's no hard feelings. Or, you know, man, I'm just just happy to be here. hope you accept my hard work. And I, you know, just, I'm just trying to just break the ice and stuff like that. He said, it's all good, man. It's, it's all good. Yeah. And then things just went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> things just went crazy. You, you, were, you were part of the Bulls team that won 72 games that season, which was an NBA record at the time. It only recently got beat by Golden State when they won 73 in 2015. What was it like to just be on that dominant of a team in the NBA? 
I think I think once we, once we got to know each other, like after, after the first uh, five or six games, we knew to say, hey, this is it. This is going to be it. Okay, we are going straight to it. We, we can't lose the playoffs. We can't do this. Can't do that. No one expected us. To, we didn't expect to win seventy two games. I expected once we got to like sixty, I said we can win seventy five games this year. We can do. We can do a lot of cool stuff and stuff like that. People was coming all over the world, man, to watch us. I mean, you see people from London, England, Australia, stuff like that. People coming all over the world and stuff like that. And you go to the opposing team's stadium, you see like banners of just Chicago. I mean, all over the place. And then we get off the plane, you see hundreds and hundreds of people. You go to the hotel, you see thousands of people. And somebody, we, we thought we was like the Beatles or Rolling Stones when we walk out the, out the plane, when we walk the bus and go in the hotel. So it's like, damn, you know. But that right there was cool though because we didn't take that as like, oh, we're the shit. Well, we, well, you know, we don't need to win today. No, we took that like, okay, great. Like people sitting in, in the stands. That's how we took it and stuff like that. We didn't let that, you know, disturb us. Deter us from going for where we, uh, I go. And uh, that was that was the greatest thing about that team, man. That team, Chicago. We, everyone had their head on straight. Okay. And you won a championship that year. Your third one. Did that one feel different than your other two championships? It just felt good because of the fact that it was like, Michael just lost his father, right? Mm, Michael yeah. just lost his father. And I was like, wow. I yeah, mean, I just like, wow, I can't believe this. I said, I, it's actually really happening. You know, it's like the 30 seconds just rolling down. Like, this is actually really happening. We win another championship. And I said, wow, I'm actually doing it with Chicago Bulls. So the Detroit Pistons, <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> and that's why you, if you see on the videos and stuff like that, the first championship in the locker room, Everybody come over and start putting champagne on me because it's like, wow. <laughs> I'm like, Ooh, they actually like me. You know? <laughs> so, Cause I never talked to I never talked to none of my teammates. Ever. Right. I never went out with them. I never did anything. Until I talked to them, it's like in practice. Playing that, I, I won't say anything to them. Okay. Um, so you win that championship. And then that next year, John Sally actually joins the bull, the Bulls. <laughs> you bringing all this old stuff up? Yeah, um, yeah you, you'd be surprised how many Chicago, uh, Detroit Pistons on that team. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's funny how you guys had the beef. You know, the Bulls and the Pistons had the beef, but ultimately the Bulls end up taking the best players pretty much from the Pistons yeah, and incorporating them. I'm, I'm like, wow, we got like four players from the Pistons that we beat them for the two peat, and wow, and like, wow, <laughs> and they playing with us. Mm-hmm. But, but, it's, well, but, it's, but it's funny it's, it's funny that you said that because I said something to John Sally in Detroit at, um, at the 1986 draft and I when, uh, had a press conference like that I said John you don't really realize one thing I'm better than you you know that right I'm better than you <laughs> I'm better than you I'm just letting you know I'm just I'm better than you so um, that's, <laughs> that's another story but I said the well, press conference Okay, and that same year, that's when you came out with your book, your autobiography. No. And to promote the book, you wore the wedding dress. <laughs> and and, and, and I, I read the book. I remember I read the book when it first came out. It was a New York Times bestseller. I mean, everyone was reading it. And I remember in the book, you said something interesting. You said, I'm not straight. I, I'm not gay, but... I'm open to things, but I haven't actually messed around with any men at this point in my life, but I am open sexually. So can you sort of explain that? I could go in details, but no, it's just more like, you know, I'm this open individual that loves people pretty much and stuff like that. You know, I don't have to be gay to love my gay community. I don't have to do that. My gay community loves me because I respect it. You know, I'm, I'm not judging them, uh, their character, uh, their desire to be who they are. I don't, I don't care about that, man. I just love my gay community. I really do. Uh, every day I'm in my gay community, you know, fraternizing with all my friends, you know, stuff like that. And they respect me. It's okay, great. Uh, so um, if, uh, and I, like I, uh, the NBA had 
uh, some type of rule on policy because I think like 10 years ago, there was a guy that was that came out and said he was getting the NBA. They made him retire. What? Really? Yeah, they made him retire. And I, was, huh. I was talking to him in Miami. He lives in Miami now with his husband. He's like six foot 11, something like that, and very successful player. And um, he came and said he was gay, and, and the NBA didn't know how to react to that, you know, and stuff like that. I'm like, wow. I was like, what? Shit, he ain't the only one, the damn system. Shit. He's <laughs> right. like, oh, he's these fucking league shit. What? <laughs> I'm like, what? You better you start reevaluating your life right now. I'm like, do you realize? Okay, great. And I, I, was, I was saying the same thing uh, in my book. I said, hey, damn, imagine if I was gay, I'd probably be the most famous athlete on the planet. Yeah, and I thought, oh, I thought we'd be the famous athlete on the planet and doing my job the way I do it. Really? And he's gay? I'm like, great, cool. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm like, hey, <laughs> to each his own. You know, I'd probably be a billionaire. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, man, I just, I, I just, I hate the fact that, you know, I think now, I think now since the, it's the 23rd century now, and people live minds are really wide open. You know, people's minds will really open up and, and just uh-huh. not focus on all this negative and all the, 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 the merits of people's lives, man. You know, people they want to get in people's lives. Yeah, but it's like, hey, if you're gay and sports, man, I don't care. I never cared at the beginning. I said it's like imagine when he had AIDS. I mean uh, uh, HIV. HIV. I, yeah. I, was, I was the only guy who stood up in the whole league say, I don't give a damn about players' ass anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, so like so I don't care, but but I don't I don't give a give a damn you gay or straight, stuff like that in the in the in the, in the world of athlete athletes and stuff like that. And uh I think a lot of people have came out in soccer, baseball, uh I think even football now. So I think a couple of guys came out and then, so hey, I think people are very open minded yeah. now. As they should be. As they should be. Well, I remember one of the things that uh Sally told me in our interviews was that when you guys would go out, you had a transgender person in your crew that you would sometimes use to trick people. I'm back with D-Rod, and, uh, and he goes, hey, we're, we're going out to eat. I'm gonna be at Morton's, Morton's Steakhouse. I had to give them a shout out why, I don't know. <laughs> My dumb ass. But anyway, we're at Morton's, and I get there, Jerry Springer's there. So I'm geeked, I wanna sit next to Jerry and talk to Jerry at this, at this dinner Dennis is having, and there's this blonde at the table. And I look down and uh, a, a blonde, the boobs, the look, the, the Marilyn Monroe is at our table. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and I look again, and I look at Dennis and I smile, and I look at Dennis and Dennis is like this. He looks at me, nods, he goes, and I go, nah. Not my style. That's all I say. And Jerry Springer said, this is pretty crazy dinner. And they, people, you know, he's talking, talking, and I'm getting to know Jerry because I want to hang with Jerry Springer. And uh, to this day, I'm cool with Jerry Springer. And I see that. And everyone goes, wow. And Dennis says, you're the only person that has not tried to holler at her. And I go, yeah, not my style, not my speed. He goes, still same old style. I said, yeah, I'm, I have a radar. It was a dude. It was a guy. And and then when he has his party at a gay club called, <laughs> I think it was called Tracks, downtown. And uh, no, um, uh, um, something breaker, um, jawbreaker or, or something like that. He has his party there. The media shows up because they have to be where Dennis is going to be up in a while. Other do so. They see the blonde who's always with him, that all these people are like, oh, my God, she's, you can't. That, it was a man. It's a man. So he's, wow. And I'm like this. And Dennis was just friends with him, but he loved the fact that everybody tried to kick it to him. Is that true? No, but Trick Peter, that was my good friend Mimi Marks in Chicago. And okay. uh, she looked like Mar- Marilyn Monroe. Mm-hmm. And I mean, looked just like her. I mean, you couldn't tell. You know. And uh, she, uh, I didn't trick people. I mean, my friends were hit on. At, right. At, 
she dressed, she dressed like a woman and had everything. Every time we lit up like a woman. And pray this. If you can uh, say, Carmel Electric's body, I want to talk about that today. Uh, Carmel Electric's body and put her face on it, that's how she looked. Like that. Okay. Literally, like that. And then and she, it's like, my guys are like, be kissing on her and stuff like, they, wait a minute. I'm like, I just start laughing. I'm like, okay, guys. Okay, okay, okay hold on. Now, without naming any names, did any other NBA players kiss on her without knowing that she's transgender? Oh, I'm not naming no names. I, I ain't doing that, no. No, I'm, I'm not asking name names, but yes or no. Did any NBA players kiss on her without knowing that she oh, was transgender? Okay. I'm not, not going go there. I, okay, I'm, fair I'm not enough. Go okay. I'm not going to do okay. that. Okay. How much did things change? Because remember, at one point, uh, Scottie Pippen was sidelined and you became Jordan's number two. Uh, what really changed when that happened? Nothing changed. We, we just kept winning. When I think Scotty was like, uh, he got injury. I think he was a little frustrated because he wanted a big contract. He wanted a big contract and Jerry Cross wouldn't give it to him and stuff like that. So I think Scotty was more like, yeah, he did have an injury, but I think it's more like he was just frustrated at that time because uh, he deserved money. So I would have paid him money. You know, Jordan got 40 million, 45 million. I said, how did Scotty get 20 million? I don't know. And stuff like that. It just give me 10. I'm good. You know, so it's okay, whatever. So I think that was the whole thing with Scott. I think he was just a little frustrated at the time. And uh, even the next year we came back, nobody was, no, we, went, um, we weren't even coming back the next year. We had to wait for Phil Jackson to say, I'm coming back. And Micah said, okay, we're coming back. Um, he got his 50 million. Scotty got his money. I got my money. And then the ball kept rolling. Right. And that next year, you guys all reunited. You guys beat the Jazz in the finals. You got your fifth and final ring. Did you feel that that was going to be your height at that point? Or did you feel like, no, I'm going to keep going? Hmm. Well, I look like this. God, if Eagles wasn't, I mean, just, I mean, people, I mean, I think it was the fact that uh, that last dance, Mm -hmm. Phil Josh came up with that. That's the last season that he said, this is the last right. dance. He wrote, he wrote a book about it. I mean, he wrote a playbook about it. He said, this is the last dance. And uh, he wasn't coming back. And I'm like, damn, man. And uh, I'm like, wow, this is it? But I said, because the next year, the next year, it was a half season. I said, we could have won this thing for four in a row. But I tried to say in the pep rally, I said, hey, let's bring this, bring everybody back together. Let's bring them back, back together and stuff like that. But it's like, wow, man, damn. You know, some days you look back and say, we could have won four in a row. Easy and stuff like that. But I think Micah got fed up. And uh, I think Scotty stayed. I think, right. he, I think he stayed. Micah left. Micah left. Well. They didn't bring me back. I feel out, and that was it. Well, then next year you went to the Lakers, uh, where you played 23 games, but you played with Kobe and Shaq. How was that compared to the Bulls when you look at those duo, that duo? It was it was hard. It was hard because I knew the fact that Shaq and Kobe wouldn't like me. Hmm. I know because uh, Jerry Butts, he loved me. I, I used to, I used to uh, date his uh, daughter. <laughs> so I just did his daughter at the time. Oh, and, okay. Uh, and uh, we did it for like six months. And uh, I knew Kobe and, and Kobe and Shaq would like me. And because a whole attention became Dennis, it, it shook me from them to me quick. I mean, you can see it in, in the stands and see it in, in, in the city and stuff like that. There's billboards, so this, like that. I'm like, I'm not trying to do anything. They, they rarely would talk to me. Even in games and stuff like that, they really talk to me, but um, I don't know. So <laughs> it's like, I think that's the main reason. I think that's the main reason why they cut me. Mm. They cut me. I said to me, I think they went to to the to, to the upper head, and they didn't want me there anymore. So when you look at playing with Kobe in his prime versus Jordan in his prime, since you played with both of them, how would you compare the two? Well, you can say it's similar, but uh, I think Michael was more driven to win. Mm. Driven to win. He didn't want, he, believe me. He didn't. He hated the fact that that 
and we're going to win, we're going to win. And he takes control of that. You know, I give him that credit right there. I give him that. It's like I was like, Scotty, Scotty had that will too. But uh, Kobe became like that. Kobe started to emulate his game like Michael and stuff like that. Uh, I think Kobe was uh, more, uh, you could say, mm, uh, more like a, like a, like a gymnast, you know, when he played. And Mike was more like branch to golf, you know, a ballet dance. Because, you know, what? most of the time he plays on his toes. When he, and when he does everything, it's always like boom, boom. You know, so the one-two punch. And uh, I think that everybody tried to, you know, say that Kobe is just like Michael. And I think that's what Michael gave him that praise at his funeral. And uh, I think he realized the fact that, yeah. Man. Well, the next year you got uh, traded to the Dallas Mavericks. And uh, were you living with Mark Cuban when you first got there? Oh, yeah. Okay. He wanted me to live with him. He said, you ain't going nowhere. You're going to come live with me. I'm like, I am? All right. Shit. The hell of a team when we live with him? Fuck it. I go live with his ass. <laughs> so, so I put over there. He said, I have a big house back here in my in my in my in my backyard. This house is huge. I was like, oh my God, like seven acres and stuff like that. You have to drive to the, the other house. I mean, it's right there on the property with pool, tennis courts, and I don't know. Just all this stuff back there, you know, this big ass house. And uh, he said, well, you're going to live right here. I said, all right, great. He said, but you got to go put some furniture in the house. I said, I got to go do it? I got to go do it? He said, yeah. <laughs> so he, he, he had these three escalators, three escalators at the house. He said, well, here's, uh, here's $100,000. Go buy all the furniture you want. I'm like, what? He said, go buy all the stuff that you want. Here's $100,000. I said, all right, great. <laughs> All right, let's go, guys. What's up with that? It was like eight security guys. I mean, they actually police officer, but they was undercover, whatever, stuff like that. They drove me to this furniture store. I got all the furniture. <laughs> Came back to the house. The next day, they brought all the furniture in, stuff like that. Obviously, I had a damn party. Yep, I had a party. <laughs> I had a party. <laughs> the next thing you know, you got fucking like, cars coming in, people coming in. You know, I bought the whole strip club back. It was just a free for all. <laughs> um, like, and next thing, like Mark said, oh. So everybody said, oh, you had a party last night. Like, yeah, I did. He said, how was it? It was great. And so, like that. So, uh, I, when I got there, I didn't play for like two weeks. I was in, in, his, um, in his backyard training every day with a trainer. So just get in shape, stuff like this. So uh, I'll just do my thing, having a good time. And, and so that's how all that happened. Well, right. You played 12 games for the Mavericks. You got six technical fouls. You rejected twice. You had a one game suspension. Um, according to Steve Nash, he claimed that you never really wanted to be a Maverick and, you know, you didn't really want to play over there. And ultimately after that stint, you retired from the NBA. What made you say, okay, I'm done with professional basketball at this point? Because I mean, you did go play for other teams, but in terms of the NBA, that was it. Nah, it wasn't like that. It's like it was. It was like, damn man, two years in a row, people don't like me here. You know, I just think that I think what I brought to the to the city. Like Mark Cuban came and got me out of Orange County. Came with his G5, this all these girls and limousines and stuff like that, trucks and stuff like that. He came and got me a root Chris. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's like, it's like, can you believe that root Chris? Root Chris. Like, like, he came to root Chris with all these people like, oh no. I said, and, and he came back and said that, hey, they're not going to have dinner with you. I said, great. He said, um, I want you to be a maverick. Now, I'm thinking like, what, not in a movie? <laughs> 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 I'm saying, what? He said, would you be a Maverick? I said, oh, you mean a Dallas Maverick? He said, like, yeah, I don't, he's not on the team. I said, you do? I'm like, great. So we, we, he was there. He came and got me and, and literally took me to Dallas on his plane the next day. The next day. I didn't ask to do that shit. I was having a good time hanging out. You know, just party my ass off. He said, you come to meet today. I had great. So I went there and stuff like that. And people said, oh, my God. You know. <laughs> That's a good story too. So I'm gonna keep it short. I'm trying to keep this interview short. Now, if you keep dragging on, uh, sorry, uh, so, sorry. Uh, yeah. So 
Mark Cuban went and announced on TV and said that, well, we just uh, acquired Dennis Rodman to the team, so that people went ballistic. They went ballistic and stuff like that. So he went and bought 21,000 jerseys with number 69 on it, because I wanted 69. And the such a story, he went and bought it, and people started buying, bought, bought them. And the next thing you know, I was coming out the tunnel with number 69, but this happened. All the officials in the NBA office said, uh-uh, you ain't doing that. <laughs> it actually pushed me back in the tunnel. They said, you ain't wanting that. <laughs> I'm literally like, that. I said, wait a minute, I can wear this number? He said, no, uh no. Because I think they thought I was trying to, you know, tell them to screw you. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's pretty much what it was from 69, you know. It's like, you ain't doing that. Uh-uh. No, no, mm -hmm. no, no. So that's when Mark Cuban, that's when I went back to got number 70. You know, so like number seven this way, so on um on the team, stuff like that. So um yeah, that's that's how how it all started. Uh, okay. But you eventually you left the NBA after that. You played for a bunch of other teams. I know my man, uh, Matt Barnes, was regular on my show. He played with you on the Long Beach Jam. The Long Beach Jam, yeah. Okay. Which was a, a kind of a start, like an ABA situation where I actually got a chance to play with Dennis Rodman for a handful of games, which was dope. <laughs> you know, being a big fan of, uh, you know, the, the Bulls movement and, and what he was doing at the time. Uh, but you played in a bunch of different teams. Um, when did you finally decide, you know something, I'm done with basketball? I, I was done basketball then. I, Matt Barnes, I played with him a couple times on that team at Long Beach, Long Beach Jam. And uh, I used to ask him, I said, man, why are you not in the NBA? I said, you actually pretty good. I said, why are you not in the NBA, man? Said, you know, he said, I don't know, man. He just won't give me a chance. I'm like, damn, once he got in the NBA, he was pretty good. I mean, that stuff like that. So I like Matt Barnes. We got along very well. So in 2013, you made a trip to North Korea <laughs> to meet with Kim Jong-un. What ultimate, because from what I understand, his father was a huge Bulls fan. Oh, right? he, he was big time, big time. <laughs> you don't even know. Right. And I mean, he tried to get other players from the Bulls to come to North Korea. Is that true? Didn't he ask Jordan to try to come to North Korea? He asked Jordan first. He asked Scotty. Mm -hmm. Then he asked me. <laughs> Boy, like I said, I went back to green quick when I heard that. He said, uh, can Dennis Rodman come in? And my agent can say, Dennis, you want to go to North Korea? I said, yeah, sure, why not? And stuff like that. And I'm thinking, I'm just going on signing books and stuff. <laughs> I figured that's what I'm doing over there. I said, all right. So he said, yeah, i go to North Korea. That was like a 20-hour flight. And then once I got off the plane, off the plane in North Korea, oh my God, dude, I, I just, I couldn't believe what I saw. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to prison in North Korea. That's what I thought, that's what it seemed like. Why did you think you were going to prison when you got there? I mean, you were an invited I, guest. I thought I did something, uh, that so-called father of mine did something back in the day. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. I'm taking a smoking blunt of it. Okay, somebody thought, I was thinking all this stuff. I see all these people in suits, in black and white suits um, on the uh, runway and stuff like that with the, with the red carpet. I'm like, something's wrong here. And I'm just like, I didn't know what's going on. And then the other plane, walking the red carpet, and as I'm walking, they all start to walk behind me. I'm like, oh, I'll just fuck up. <laughs> this, is, this is not good, man. I'm like, oh, shit. I was like, I, I just said, me and this other guy who's there. And uh, he's, he looked at me and said, like, uh-oh. I said, uh-oh, what? <laughs> he said, you look behind you. I'm like, oh, shit. And, and uh, so we go inside the hangar, and they had, like, these chairs around the wall. Around the wall, stuff like that, and then and all those people that was outside by the plane, they start to sit in these seats. I'm like, this is getting from like bad to worse, worse to worser. I'm like, what is wrong? What's the picture here? So they all sit there. It was like a hundred of them, these guys in black and white suits, and so I saw two captains' chairs, like thrones, stuff like that. I like, great. And they said, all right, what did that, what did that mean? <laughs> she says, what are you talking about this? <laughs> they don't speak no English. So I was like, all right, great. 
I go over there for a case. said, no, 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 you got to sit in this seat. And I'm like, all right. And I sit over here. And they said, all right, great. Next thing you know, they get up, start clapping. And I'm like, I said, this is wrong right now. This is not right. This is like a, like, like a fake fucking Vietnam movie. You know, it's like, what is going on? Next thing you know, this little guy walks in. The little guy. And uh, I had three interpreters with me. I said, who is that kid? He said, that's the Supreme Leader. I said, so we're going to like, inform me what that means? He said, so that's just the guy. I said, the guy, like the president guy? He said, yeah, he runs this country. And I said, all right, great. And uh, that right there shocked me. I've never in my life seen nothing like that. I mean, because I've been around, it takes a lot of things to just uh, kind of shock me. But that right there, the more I was in North Korea, and when I saw him walk in, and it, it was like, it, it was like, damn, it was like Jesus, Moses, and God just walked in here and like just got blessed. I'm like, oh my God. And when he sat down, they went, they kept going, they kept clapping, they kept, I'm like, and he kept doing this like this. They kept going. It was like 20 minutes of this shit. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, and I just kept looking at him like, is he that powerful? I said, he's that powerful? Because I didn't know anything about him. And uh, yeah, man, throughout, this, throughout the time it was in North Korea, um, I mean, they, he, he hung out with me the whole time. And I went to his house. Uh, he just had a newborn baby. I gave uh, this baby uh, like a 91 jersey. It was like this big, <laughs> so like that. So uh, yeah, and his wife. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I think they loved me because I think when I did that, what people in America said at the time, I made a mistake by saying a happy birthday to him on TV. And I'm like, I'm like, wow, sucks. But I think he, I think he loves the fact that I actually appreciate the fact that hey, we're friends. I mean, you know, he treated me as a friend. That's how I can look at it. Well, yeah, Kim Jong Un is probably the most enigmatic leader on the planet. No one knows anything about him. In fact, they were saying that Dennis Rodman knows more about Kim Jong Un than the entire U.S. government combined. Yep, I, I, I can tell you, I, I, I ain't gonna say it on TV, but yeah. We we actually talked a lot, man. Me and him just on, you know, we been on one of his islands, his ski resorts, his um, his um, planes, helicopters, and stuff like that. I've, I've been everywhere with that kid, man. And we used to sit there, talk, smoke cigars, and uh, he just sit there, like literally. We just like like we buddies, you know, like for years and stuff like that. So he made sure that I was okay. He made sure that. He threw a party for me, man, at a stadium. Weird. And it was 140,000 people there. And he asked 140,000 people. And he asked him to put me on the stage. There. And that's when he stood up and started clapping. And I was just standing out there in front of 140,000 people. Like, all right. I'm like, wow. And he, he even helped me, he even drove me around. With all his uh, cars and stuff like that, he even drove me around to find me a condo, and that's true story. Oh, oh he wanted you to live in North Korea. Yeah, he wanted me to move to North Korea. I said, "Dude, I can't do this <laughs> because you went around just looking for condos for me, for me to live there." I'm like, uh, "Whoa, well, that means I can never come back here." <laughs> wow, can you imagine me doing that kind of stuff like that? Man, I, I probably would have did it. You know, if I could go back and forth, yeah, I probably would have do what I want and got my you know, vacation home in North Korea and hanging out. <laughs> well, right, but didn't like the, the, the timing of your trip, right? Like when you went there, didn't they release one of their prisoners of war like uh, right afterwards, like the day after? So, so you were really responsible for someone being freed, but I guess he died right afterwards. No, but he was he right? was already sick in the end again. He was already sick. Yeah. I, I even spoke to him, but I'm saying that as I, as I was, I think it was some uh, once or twice I was over there. As I was getting off the plane, there was a G G five, a, a private plane right there, and I looked over. I said, "Who is that?" 
a new date. It's like security people walking to the plane. So like they said, no, this one, it was a prisoner that was over here. I'm like, mm -hmm. I was like, oh Lord. I'm thinking, wow. I said, I think I had something to do with that. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think I had something to do with that. But I got hatred after that. After That's being crazy. I got hatred. I had to go to rehab. Huh. <laughs> Literally had to go to rehab. I mean, do you think based on what you know about Kim Jong-un and the time that you guys spent together, there could ever be a time where Kim Jong-un and America could get along and actually open up the trade and, and make money together and, and have travel back and forth? Because, you know, South Korea obviously is like that, but North Korea is not. <laughs> but you know, he went to South Korea, right? He never did that. But you know, he huh. he walked in South Korea. Because South Korea and North Korea is pretty much like, if you take the the, the road going towards South Korea, something like that, it's literally 10 feet from each other. From, right. Just like that, like that. That's how close it is. That's how close it is. So he walked in there with uh, President Moon. I hung out with him, President Moon a few times and stuff like that. Yeah. And South Korea, it's like, it's Americanized. So right. it's Americanized. So it's like everything you go to, you know, Chuck and Jive and stuff like that. They got all this American food uh, chains over there, shot their malls and stuff like that. So, yeah. And President Moon, they, they, didn't, they don't even like him. <laughs> so his own country. So it's like, great. But, uh, yeah, man, that's, uh, like I said, I've done a lot of cool shit, man. A lot of cool stuff. Yeah, and that was probably, like I'm saying, like when you look at the world stage, that was probably the most amazing thing that I saw you do. Well, I, you mentioned Putin. I was saying I went here for two weeks in Russia. Wait, wait, wait you, you hung out with Putin for two weeks in Russia? Yeah, yeah. He was, to me, he was cool to me, too. So every time we go out, every time we go out, so it's like, oh, shit. But he got fucking... 12, 13 models with him. <laughs> and every day we go out to eat and somebody that go to parties, like, these models are like just right there with us. I'm like, wow, <laughs> man, you do this every day? That's <laughs> crazy. You know, I got with him too. So, uh, yeah, man. I mean, just, 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 you know, man, just living life, man. You know, I just, I'm just very privileged just even being involved with what's going on today. And uh, I'm just, so, uh, I just, it's, it's, it's just, it's a privilege just to even let people even still like me. Uh, people even don't even recognize me. That's, that's just even an honor in itself, bro. What was Putin like in person? Like, what was his personality like based on when you guys hung out? It's just like, I play this, just like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, people be surprised how people loosen up when, when they're having fun. And just, I mean, just regular person, man. We, you know, drink vodka, champagne, da da da. We, hey, you know, we hyping it up, brother. You know, so like basically how it was. But you know, when he gets in this mode, you know, this presidency mode, stuff like that. But in that, we had fun. Right. Well, because weren't you supposed to go over there over the whole the Britney Griner situation? But did that happen or not happen? But, and people even said, I think I had something to do with that too. Uh, so I said, I asked people, I said, you think I should go over there? And because I know Putin, I see, I think he'll welcome me to come over there. And I actually started mentioning it on TV and, and interviews and stuff like that. I said, hey, yeah, you know, it's Brittany Griner. Okay, great. And I even sent a message to her on TV and stuff like that. So I think that when they released her, I think it, it was, people don't really, really know the whole deal with that. Why that even really, really went down like that. I think um, I don't think she's ever expressed that really deeply. I think the fact that um, it, it was just one of those, I think it's one of those things where, and 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 the, and the crazy thing about it, when as us Americans, we sit and try to trade with them. I'm like another president for her. I'm like, wait up here, what is that? You know, did you? We, um, Remember that they try to do yeah, that. Well, the, the well, the Merchant of Death <laughs> was basically traded for her, right? Just, I'm the just Lord of Lord of War, you know, based on the movie. I'm just you know? saying, wow, man, this is not right, man. Did you go actually trade this? And I'm like, but it's, I'm, it's I don't think that's the first time she ever uh, had weed or uh, any substance on her. I don't, think, I don't think that's the first time. I think it just happened at that particular time. And next thing you know, it's like, oh, Lord. And uh, I guess the wife went over there, some girl went over there, and they let a visitor, or she just met at the airport, right? Uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think her wife went over there. 
No, I don't I, I think, think so. She, I think she met at the airport and stuff like that. Yeah, so. at the airport when she came back, right. Yeah. But but I don't think she would I don't think she would have gone to Russia because she might have gotten detained herself, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, no, I don't think that would have happened. But no, I just I just think that it is it was a good it's a good thing that they actually did that. I think I think um the president president did something, made a deal. I think he made a deal. And right. I, I put I literally I'll put it out there to stuff like that. Even even they president talks about me all the time. This other day he was talking about me. I was like, why is he saying this shit? But if he said some good stuff, but I said, I said, well, he made a deal. And it had to be a hell of a deal. I mean, literally. I mean, <laughs> when they start asking for something and then you start bargaining with them, I'm like something happened. They, they must have released somebody that no one knows about. <laughs> and that's why she's home now today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that, you know, just, just in retrospect, I think Brenda Griner, I mean, a lot of people didn't like her, you know, because I think her attitude was really like, not wasn't properly uh, understood. But uh, I think that that right there, it was, it was so sad how it happened. I think that probably, that was like a life changing experience in so many ways in her, in her future. And uh, I think that, uh, like I said, very unfortunate, man. I don't, I don't, I don't like, I don't ask for anybody to go through that thing right there. That she had to cut her hair, she had to do all this stuff. I mean, everything. And uh, so uh, I think that she has a hell of a story to tell. And I just wish her well. <laughs> literally, literally, I just hope that people just uh, just understood and understand the fact that hey, I don't, I don't ask anyone to even go through something like that. You know, that's right. Boy, that is insane. And uh, I'm glad she's mentally um, stable. And I uh, hope that's not going to be a, a factor of life to move on. It's what's uh, playing ball over here or playing ball across the country. I think she deserves another shot to play somewhere else in the world. You know, so yeah. I don't think they should fear her not to go back uh, to go play what she loves the, the best. So I think that she's going to get another opportunity. I'm saying good luck. In 2021, you made the NBA 75th anniversary team. <laughs> Took the shot on that one. Well deserved. Mm. Congratulations! I think it was very well deserved that you made it on the 75th uh, anniversary team, and that's when you you and Jordan saw right. each other for the first time in a wow. while, and you were like, "We got to hang out." Right. You know. Yeah. Um, but overall, man, such an incredible career on and off the court. Right, uh, five rings, greatest rebounder of all time. The fact that you're meeting. <laughs> with the, the leaders of countries that U.S. presidents can't even meet with sometimes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not even sometimes. No one's met with Kim Jong-un. You yeah. know, I think it'd be a hard time to meet with Putin these days. And and really, I think that you brought something to the NBA that no one has ever brought before. I think Allen Iverson kind of brought a certain style, you know, what? a certain kind of urban style to what? the NBA. But you brought kind of a, a be yourself, let me be unique you know culture. what I'm saying? Like, this culture. is me. Yeah, but you ought to call it culture. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, man, I, I think that uh, people really don't give you the props that you deserve sometimes. That's all good, but, man. <laughs> but, but, man, I've been such a huge fan. I am so, so grateful that you came in today, man. All the best to you. All right, bro. All the love for you, man. Yes, sir. Until next time. Peace.